This is so good. Excuse me. I thought I'd sneak a bite of soy before shooting. <laughs> Welcome back to Menopause Taylor, the YouTube channel that equips you with all the tools you need to succeed at managing your menopause your way. I'm Menopause Barbie, your hungry professor. This is video number 332, and it's part of a big unit on endometrial uterine cancer. And we're just starting to discuss all your options for preventing it. Last week, I presented the principles of preventing it. And all the videos that remain in this unit will adhere to those principles. Today, we'll be discussing your dietary options for preventing endometrial uterine cancer. In my book, both editions, first and second, this information is in chapter 31, the uterine cancer chapter, under the heading diet and lifestyle options. If you're considering using food to help manage your menopause, you need to watch this video. So let's start by recapping the basic principles you learned last week for preventing endometrial uterine cancer. The overall summary was as follows. Regardless of how old, fat, or feminine you are, the most important principle for preventing endometrial uterine cancer is balancing estrogen and progesterone. You must avoid excess estrogen and unopposed estrogen. So today we'll talk about getting your estrogen and progesterone from food. If you're a foodie, you might really like this video. Or you might not. <laughs> the first thing to do in any presentation on getting your estrogen and progesterone from food is to designate the foods that contain estrogen and progesterone. So let's separate the two hormones and designate the food items that contain estrogen first and then we'll designate the food items that contain progesterone. Way, way back in video number 28, <laughs> I taught you all about the foods that contain estrogen and they're called phytoestrogens. Phytoestrogens are plant sources of estrogen. I gave you a series of videos on phytoestrogens from video 25 through video 30. And you learned that phytoestrogens are very weak forms of estrogen with very low likelihood of binding to estrogen receptors. And I used puzzle pieces to demonstrate estrogen receptor sites on cells. And these are analogous to parking spots that harbor estrogen-only signs on them at a big stripper, strip center. In other words, the only kind of hormone that can park in an estrogen-only parking spot is an estrogen molecule, and phytoestrogens qualify. However, they have to compete against other estrogen molecules for the spot. And whether or not a phytoestrogen will get the spot really depends on whether there are other kinds of estrogen molecules around. And then it depends on what kind of other estrogen molecules are around. If your own estrogen or pharmaceutical estrogen or compounded estrogen are present, then a phytoestrogen stands very little chance of parking in an estrogen-only parking spot. And that's because phytoestrogens have a much lower attraction or affinity for the spot than all the other forms of estrogen. So this is what you end up with. High affinity and low affinity. The phytoestrogen has very low affinity. All the other forms of estrogen are 50 1,500 to 11,000 times more likely to get the parking spot. And even if a phytoestrogen does get the parking spot, once it's there, it's much weaker than all the other forms of estrogen. The other forms of estrogen are 100 to 1,000 times stronger than phytoestrogens. So that's what you see here. Phytoestrogens here are very, very weak compared to other types of estrogen here. So 
The very first thing to understand about phytoestrogens is that they are extremely weak compared to all other forms of estrogen. This is a very important principle of phytoestrogens. Once you understand that, you can go on to the fact that there are three categories of phytoestrogen food sources. There are isoflavones, ligonans, and cumestans, and we'll go through them one by one. The isoflavones are by far the largest and most significant group of phytoestrogens. And even though the isoflavones are the strongest estrogen-containing foods, they are still very, very weak compared to all other sources of estrogen. They include all the foods that are made from soybeans. So you have things like tofu and tempeh and meat substitutes made from soy, dairy substitutes made from soy like cheese, yogurt, what else do I have here? I have to look underneath my little desk here. Milk. There's miso, soup, garbanzo beans, and soybeans. I don't have those. The second group is the lignans. The lignans comprise the second category of phytoestrogens. Lignans are part of the cell wall of plants. And you'll be surprised at all the foods that are lignans. They include flax seeds, pumpkin seeds, and sunflower seeds. What else do I have? I have, oh, green tea, black tea, cranberries, broccoli, garlic, lots of stuff. And then there's a third category of phytoestrogens in food that are the cumestans. And cumestans, again, include sunflower seeds and also bean sprouts, which I don't have here to show you. So you really have a smorgasbord of dietary sources of estrogen from which to choose. And all these sources of estrogen can serve to thicken your endometrial lining to create this. But because they're all so weak, they will not do so to an extent even close to what your own estrogen or pharmaceutical estrogen or compounded estrogen can do. But then now we come to our sources of dietary progesterone. So which food items contain progesterone? What? What did you say? I can't hear you. When you don't speak up, it tells me that you want a quiz question. <laughs> I'm so mean. No, I'm actually not mean, but I am still going to give you a quiz question. <laughs> Which of the following food items contain progesterone? A. Cauliflower B. Cabbage C. Wild yam D. Chased berry tea E. Brazil nuts F. Chia seeds G. Gooseberries H. Onions I. All of the above J. A and B above K. C and D above, L, E, and F above, M, none of the above. Which is it? If you've been watching all my videos in order, that should have been easy. But even if you have watched them in order, I don't expect you to remember every detail. That's why I come back to things from time to time. That's why I think a quiz question like this is good once in a while. It jogs your memory. So here's the answer highlighted in bold. Are you stumped or shocked? Did you fall for the wild yam trick? If you did, you have fallen prey to marketing. I taught you in video 37 that wild yams contain estrogen, not progesterone. But I left them out of the, our list of estrogen containing foods so that I could tease you <laughs> with this quiz question. Wild yams are phytoestrogens, so they are very weak estrogens just like all the other phytoestrogens. The reason you see so many products labeled as wild yam progesterone is because labs use wild yams as an estrogen source 
that they then convert into progesterone. But the wild yam itself contains estrogen, not progesterone. So that leaves only one food source of progesterone. It is chaseberry tea. Can you believe that there is a big smorgasbord of estrogen-containing foods and just one progesterone-containing food? And it's a beverage. This is the kind of thing that is so critical to your menopause education. Why? Because the most important principle for preventing endometrial uterine cancer is a balance between estrogen and progesterone. So if you intend to use food as a means of preventing endometrial uterine cancer, you had better love chaseberry tea. Have you ever even had chaseberry tea? If you've had a hysterectomy or an endometrial ablation, you can eat all the phytoestrogens you want without balancing them with progesterone. And that's because with either a hysterectomy or an endometrial ablation, you don't have to worry about getting endometrial uterine cancer. In both cases, you have no endometrial lining. But if you still have your uterus and you intend to prevent endometrial uterine cancer with your diet, you have to balance your estrogen intake with your progesterone intake. And face it, how are you going to know how much you need of each? Let's see. We'll put some phytoestrogens here on this side. And we'll put some chaseberry tea here. Oh, that's not going to work. How about if I put more chaseberry tea? Not going to work either. Hmm. Gosh. I don't think there's any way to do this. I know not of a single study that tells us how much chaseberry tea you need to drink in order to counter the effect of estrogen in any of the phytoestrogens. This is the big limitation to trying to prevent endometrial uterine cancer with dietary options alone. If you attempted to do that, you would most likely fail because there are so many sources of dietary estrogen and only one source of dietary progesterone. And if you have too much fat, well, your fat produces estrogen too, so that would be on this side. Fat produces the estrogen called estrone which can also act on your uterus to thicken your endometrial lining. So, it causes this also. So you really have to be careful using dietary options to prevent endometrial uterine cancer. The bottom line for using dietary options for preventing endometrial uterine cancer is that dietary sources of estrogen are plentiful, but dietary sources of Progesterone are limited to chaseberry tea. And this makes it difficult to use diet successfully to prevent endometrial uterine cancer. My goal is to ensure your success in your menopause management. And when there are pitfalls that will set you up to fail, I will always point them out. This inequity in estrogen versus progesterone containing foods is one of them. So, I don't have my uterus, which means I can eat all the phytoestrogens I want, and I'm hungry. But next week, we'll discuss dieting, ting, I-N-G, to prevent endometrial uterine cancer. Go to menopausetaylor.me to schedule a consultation if you want my personal help on anything. Go to Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram if you just like social media. Subscribe right here for my newsletter and this channel and come back in a week. <laughs> Bye!